2020 is over. It's 2021. We are starting a new year. Um, if you are on the Zoom, um, just remember to be stay on mute. If you have any questions, you can use the chat box. If you're here in the room, I'm going to pause in between each section and ask if you guys have any questions. Feel free to ask. Um, if you are in the room, there's decaf coffee and cookies. Um, so please help yourself um, at any point. Um, Andrew is going to be monitoring the chat room or the, the chat function and same with um, admitting people into the meeting. So. Thank you. All righty. We're ready to rock and roll. Andrew, you good? I think so. Okay. Awesome. So this is our first hybrid meeting where we're half online and maybe one quarter in person or three fourths online, a quarter in person. So if you do have any technical difficulties while you're online, we are going to, this meeting is being recorded, right? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we will send it out just in case. Um, if you're like, I can't hear anything or your internet dropped out, don't worry about it. Um, we've got you covered. Um, so I'll let you know. Oh, okay. So what are we going to be talking about tonight? We actually have quite a bit to go over. So um, just strap on in. Um, I have one extremely important announcement. Um, so we'll let the suspense set in. Um, we're gonna go over last year's um, sales, what the market looked like. Um, then we're gonna go over what the market's going to look like this year. Um, and that's new sessions, what the COVID restrictions are, um, what our footprint is going to look like. We're briefly going to go over the attendance policy. Um, we're also going to talk about our midweek market and the changes that we're making to that. And then um, the last part of the presentation, I'm really excited about. Um, way, way back in 2019, I went to a conference and it was about farmers markets. Um, and it was in Chicago. It was a big meeting. Um, I can't even remember what it was called, but Sorry, Andrew muted me. Um, so it, the, uh, these people who were working with farmers markets in New York City came and presented on um, customer behavior and basically how you can increase sales um, based off of visual marketing in your booth. And um, he shared his um, presentation deck with me. And so I'm gonna be sharing some of that with you guys tonight. I wanted to do it last year, but <laughs> obviously there was a lot of other things going on last year that I didn't get to share that. So the extremely important announcement um, is that I am pregnant. So yes, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I'm very pregnant, um, very, very pregnant. Um, I know. <laughs> so um, I'm pregnant with a little girl. I am 33 weeks. So for those who do math, I am due very early in April um, or in May, sorry, not early April. Um, I'm due in May. Um, my due date is um, actually Mother's Day. And so we have hired um, somebody to help while I am on maternity leave. And that lady is Danya. She's here in the room. You're going to have to, I can't turn my computer or else we'll lose the presentation. This is Danya. Um, so we interviewed, uh, we got a lot of applications for the assistant role. We interviewed about eight and Danya, um, Andrew and I were in total agreement that this is who we wanted running our market. So she is fantastic. Um, and I have, I have everything that I want to say written down just because pregnancy squirrel brain. Um, so if I start reading, I'm sorry. Um, but so yes, she is going to be a paid employee who's going to run the market for me while I'm gone. I'll most likely take all of May and part of June, May, June. Um, so just be ready for that. Um, she is the manager while I am gone. 
So follow her directions, make sure to treat her with respect. I don't, I don't foresee any problems, um, but just wanted to make it clear that um, she is the acting manager. And that means she's gonna hold just as much responsibility during the market um, as I would if I were there. Um, to contact her, her email address is fm at downtownbentonville.org. However, once I'm gone, all of my email is just gonna automatically forward to her. And the same goes with the phone number. That is my work phone number. When I'm gone, all of those, all those calls are gonna be forwarded to her. So don't text that number being like, gosh, we don't like the new manager. We can't wait for you to come back. That, yeah, that would be a mistake. You can email that to Andrew when text Andrew. Um, but so that is the number. Um, if you somehow don't, if you have a different number in your phone for who the Bentonville market manager is, this is the correct number. It's possible that you might have my personal phone number. Um, and if you do, and you start texting me market stuff, I'm, I'm not gonna respond depending on how much sleep I've had, like I might delete you from my phone. Um, so just make sure that you're contacting this number if you need to call or text. Um, something that is interesting about this number is that it is a Google phone number, which basically means like it's somehow connected to our phone, but it's not, when you call, it doesn't show your number or your contact, even if it's saved as like a Google um, contact. So when you call, it just shows up saying you're getting a work call. So basically what that means is that if you call, you need to leave a message because we don't know who's calling if you don't leave a message. You can just text, You can if you don't wanna leave a voice message, just send a quick text saying like, hey, this is so-and-so, just give me a call when you can. Um, so if you're like, I call you and I call you and I call you. Um, it's probably that you're not leaving a message because what it shows up on my phone is that I got a missed call from work and it doesn't give me the contact information. So does anybody have any questions about Danya? The number you've got now is the same old number that you're gonna have? Yes. Yeah, I've got no problem. So this number, I don't know. I don't think it's changed. I think Dylan had this number, didn't he? I don't know. Um, but this number isn't changing. Um, so yeah, you'll get a hold of who you need to get a hold of, whether I'm gone um, or back. Um, are there any other questions? Did anything come through? Awesome. All right. So we're going to go into a brief up, um, recap on last year. Um, so because of COVID. That's the right number. Yes. Okay. Um, so because of COVID, um, there were initially some pretty crazy restrictions on what the farmer's market could do and couldn't do. Um, I think the restriction at the time was you can have a farmer's market, but you have to limit it to 50 people inside the market footprint. And we were like, that is impossible. <laughs> like we have a very large market, 50 people would be our vendors and that would be it. Um, and so through the suggestion of a vendor, we decided to open the drive through farmer's market. So the drive through only lasted 10 weeks. Um, we started May 2nd. We had a little bit of a delayed opening. But on average, we saw 300 to 400 cars a Saturday, and that translated into $13,000 in average weekly sales. We were also restricted on vendor type. Um, if you all remember, only... Um, people who were selling edible items were allowed at the market. Crafters weren't, and artisans weren't allowed. Um, and so obviously the drive through farmer's market wasn't what we wanted to be in for the entirety of the season. I think that it was absolutely necessary that we have a market that we opened, um, that we kept it relevant, especially since other local markets, um, I think Rogers had, had delayed until June Fayetteville was actually operating under the, um, the 50 people limitation because they were still in their, their winter, winter model, I think. Um, and then Bell Vista just totally canceled their market altogether. So it was really important that we um, had a market. And so I know that the drive through wasn't perfect, um, but it did sustain us. Um, and I know that $13,000 
on average a week sounds doesn't sound that great. However, if you actually look at what the average sales per vendor were, we really weren't behind 2019 that far. So 2020 is the green line um, and 2019 is the blue line. And there are some weeks here where we were really close to kind of hitting some of those sales numbers. In 2019, during those 10 weeks, we had 53 vendors, I think, on average participate. Um, and for the drive through model in 2020, we had exactly 50%. So this is pretty incredible um, to me that showed that our market was actually pretty strong, even though we were in those 10 weeks. Um, oh, okay. here we go. So, um, and this average sales per vendor kind of gives more of like an apples to apples comparison. Because when you start looking at actual sales data, like, you know, it's really hard to compare what 53 vendors are doing sales wise to what 20 vendors are doing sales wise. However, as soon as we got back on the square, oh our markets oh jumped, they doubled. Um, and then yeah. what is even more phenomenal someone's on I think someone's talking uh, what's even more phenomenal is that for the last nine market weeks we beat 2019 sales numbers so and eight weeks in a row I mean that's probably like the longest hot streak the market's ever had and that's absolutely phenomenal um, and so I think that the market what basically this is telling us is that we have, Bentonville is a really strong market that we have customers who are going to show up to our market no matter what. Again, the drive-through model, it wasn't perfect. I know that like obviously our sales, you know, they, they did hurt, you know, we were hurting in sales. Um, but the fact that people would show up week after week and sometimes that wait in that traffic line was 45 minutes to an hour and that they wanted to show up because you guys have a product that's a premium product. You guys are out there, you're building relationships with customers and that really, really shows in the sales numbers. So you guys should feel really proud of last year. Um, I know that you know it was a tough year, um, but yeah, I think that based off of those last eight weeks, I mean, we're gonna start the market this year really strong. So I'm excited about it. Um, let's see, does anybody have any questions about last year's sales or? Awesome. All righty. Stephanie, I would mention that um, our art market did really well. So if, if you, you know that we had the art market on the kind of the grassy area over there and they, they ended up doing pretty well. I guess they were with us for maybe 15 weeks. Would that make sense about, about 15 weeks? Um, so I, you know, I think it's good that they brought some people maybe that hadn't been to the market before. And you guys obviously brought a lot of people who hadn't been to see the art before. So uh, we'll be doing that again this year as well. We'll be having that art market. No, I'm good. You're good. Oh, sorry. I'm back now. Let's see, Is there anything in the chat? I have a a thing that says somebody's you see that? oh yes the new cat awesome um okay so back to saturday farmers market so what is the market going to look like this year um so we are starting a week earlier than we had originally um put in the guidelines so we are actually starting april 10th now and i'll get to why in a minute um so that that changes our sessions so this was emailed out to you all in your acceptance email but feel free to write it down um, just know that our start date is now april 10th and that we're going through october 30th um, and if you are a second vendor who are who's starting in the second session you're now starting june 19th rather than whatever it says in the guidelines um, also something that we are um, Last year, we had the curbside pickup for the Saturday market, and we offered curbside on Thursdays and Saturdays. Um, this year, we are not going to offer curbside pickup on Saturdays. We're still going to continue it on Thursdays, and I'll talk more about that later. 
Um, but the app will still be open and functional if you want to use it. So if you were a vendor who used the app on Saturdays last year, you can still use it and you can collect pre-orders, um, but customers will be picking those up at your booth rather than through the curbside pickup or in our office. So that's just one change. Um, so I do have some bad news. Um, we, so October 9th, we have to move the market off the square. And this is because the city has moved the date for their half marathon. So normally the half marathon takes place April 10th and because of COVID, they want to move it back. And they've decided that October 9th has to be their day and that they need the square. So Andrew and I pushed back on the city um, and you, we, we did our best to plead our case. Like, hey, this is an enormous headache. You know, we basically have to reinvent the market for one day, not to mention the fact that this is going to affect all of our vendors, all of the customers. Um, and the city basically came back and said um, that this was a non-starter. So um, we have communicated to the city that we are very disappointed in their decision. Uh, you are welcome to as well. Um, if you wanna send a note to Andrew and I, and if you wanna vent it out, we will forward that on to the, the people who um, have made that decision. If you wanna go ahead and just email the mayor's office, um, that's an option. But October 9th, we will not be on the square um, and you are not being charged for that date. Um, so that's why we are starting April 10th. Um, you are also not being charged for April 10th. So there are 30 Saturdays that the market will take place this season and you are only being charged for 28 of them. So I feel like that is the most fair, um, that's the, the best way to do it. Um, so I do want you to know, I like, I have processed my frustration. Um, and like I said before, our market is strong. We have a successful market. People are gonna show up no matter where we are. And so while this is a really big headache and it is really frustrating, um, I'm choosing to have a positive attitude about it. We are going to tackle this just like we did COVID last year. Um, and this might be a setback, but it's not gonna steal any of our momentum. Um, Andrew and I and DBI will be marketing the snot out of October 9th. This is like probably the market that everybody in the community will know about because it's changing locations. We're gonna do our best to make sure that that is communicated far and wide. Um, I would like for this market to be somewhat themed, like if it's our dog days market or something so that there's another component of it um, that we can get people drummed up and get people excited about it. Um, we don't know what it's gonna look like yet. We have a request out to First Baptist for their parking lot. Um, so just know that information's coming. We're gonna to put together a game plan um, and then we're gonna send all that information out to you. Um, but wanted to give you a heads up because um, that's a big one. But does anybody have any questions? You can ask Andrew. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, First Baptist is on A Street, so they are that way and to the left. Yeah, so we're still trying to target the downtown area. Um, but again, exactly. Cynthia said no one's going to come to the uh, going to run in the in the marathon because everyone's going to be at the market. That's the attitude. Market had to move. Fifteen years ago. Because we we've done that in Rogers here in Bill. Yeah. They always kicked us out of the city. I put us out on the outskirts, and even then we didn't have to pay or nothing. We still would because it's such a hassle to get everything. That's the biggest problem we got. All the crowds there and trying to find a way to get to your stuff. 
No, and yeah, yeah, and that's that's the reality of it, and it's just one of those things where it's like you know we're just gonna have to choose our attitude, and um, yeah, I'm choosing to be positive. Again, people showed up to Memorial Park, um, and that's way outside the downtown corridor. So um, yeah, so I know it's gonna be a hassle, but we're gonna get there. Um, oh no, you're fine. Um, okay, so COVID restrictions. These are probably gonna change like tomorrow. Like who knows what our COVID restrictions are actually going to be. But as of today at 6.52 on Tuesday, March 23rd, these are what will be in place for the market. So we still have tents that are going to be 10 feet apart. Masks are still gonna be required for both vendors and customers, even if you're vaccinated. Um, we are still going to have marked entrances, entrances and exit with security. Last year we had security and they passed out masks and let people know, hey, this is an event that you're required to wear a mask inside. Um, we will still have proper signage encouraging people to stay safe and to, you know, be six feet apart. Um, I think one thing that will stay um, beyond COVID markets is having hand sanitizer at your booth. I think that's just a great thing to have. Um, and now it is not <laughs> like um, you can buy it. <laughs> so please have hand sanitizer at your booth. We're gonna have those little hand sanitizer stations at the entrances and exits. So this is how we're positioning the market. Again, this might change at some point. Um, these restrictions might lift. Um, it's also, um, Andrew, is he still in here? Oh, yeah. Um, he might be able to speak a little bit more to this, but there are some, like some mandates might get lifted, but the state's still going to have guidelines and we're still going to follow those guidelines. Um, so what Andrew was telling me is that um, if you choose not to follow the guidelines, then you lose your immunity, which basically means if there was a COVID outbreak and somehow they linked it back to the farmer's market, we would be open to lawsuits. Um, so while mask mandates might get lifted, if that's still in the guidelines, we as an event for the public are still gonna follow those guidelines. So just wanna be clear about that up front. Um, Andrew, do you have anything to add? Okay. Does anybody have any questions about COVID restrictions? Awesome. All right. I know we know how it works. So, you know, we have a whole year under our belts. Um, so this is what a typical farmer's market, um, excuse me, farmer's market layout looks like. This is our typical footprint. So right here, this is Main Street um, and Main Street is attached right here. Um, this is Second Street and this is attached here. Um, so this is basically what has been approved by the city and we can maximize this space um, for the farmer's market. So in a typical non-COVID year, we have up to 120 plus 10 by 10 spaces. So that means in a non-COVID year, we can accommodate like more than 120 vendors in those 10 by 10 spaces. So this is going to be our socially distanced footprint and we can only accommodate 64 vendors with this footprint. So we had 130 applications and so we only have around 64 vendors who are, are participating. So um, just wanted to let y'all know that you're one of the select few. Um, so last year we didn't have Northeast, we didn't have both sides of Northeast A and we didn't have both sides of Maine. This year we're adding those sides back. Um, and that's because we need those extra spots. And we feel that if we are doing the, the social distancing of the tents, um, that that will be enough. Um, it still shows that we're attempting social distance regulations. Um, the reason we didn't use those last year is because those streets are really narrow. They don't have the extra parking um, on the off sides. And so the city was worried that we'd be getting lines and that those areas might get bottlenecked. Um, but this year we're gonna use them. Um, 
because it it we we need to accommodate more vendors. Um, let's see here. So I know that there is a perception that being on side streets is not as good as being on the square. And that might be something that market managers and people who run farmers markets and vendors will always disagree on. Um, but last year we had, because we weren't able to fit as many people on the square, we had tenured vendors who were off on some of these side streets. And we had one vendor in particular who once they showed up to the farmer's market and were participating, the second week that they were back at the market, they were on a side street. They beat their highest grossing sales date of 2019 when they were located on the square. So their very, very best day in 2019 on the square, they beat in a COVID year on a side street um, and then the next week they beat that number again. So I'm not saying that second street is where you need to be, but what I'm trying to communicate is that there are so many factors that go into what sales are that day. Um, on any given Saturday, on any, and even from a year to year basis, you know, 2020 we had a pandemic. So obviously that affected our sales. You know, this year, there's crazy road construction going on on the square. We don't know what kind of impact that's going to have. Um, the population growth in this area every year is just going higher and higher. Um, on a Saturday, it depends on weather. It depends on if the hogs are playing. It depends on if there's other craft shows going on. There are so many factors that go into your sales on any given Saturday and your location is just one of those factors. So don't feel like if you're on the square that you're locked into some sort of bracket for sales. And same with on Second Street or on Main Street, you're, you're not locked in. Your sales can be as high as anybody else. Um, basically what I want to communicate is that you can't rely on your location to make sales for you. If you have a good product, if you're passionate about your product, if you're engaging with people, people are going to find you and people are going to want to continue to buy from you. And that is regardless of wherever you are. So somebody might say, oh, well, I was on second street one week and then I got bumped up to the square and my sales were higher. And yeah, that's possible. And it could be that the weather was great that day or whatever. Um, but there's no way to eliminate all those factors in order to figure out, you know, what is the best space on the square. Um, so I also don't want you to, to hear me say that I don't, that locations don't matter. They do matter. Um, and if you have a space that you would like to be in, um, that you have a preference, you are always allowed to tell me what your preference is. Uh, just know that I might not be able to accommodate it. Um, you know, with, we're extra limited this year, um, but just as always, you know, you're, I'm not able to make, to give everyone their own preference. Um, but if you get your um, vendor location and you're like, hey, you know what? I kind of liked where I was last year. Or, you know, I would kind of like to target being on this side of the square. Please feel free to let me know. Again, the chances of me being able to make that switch might be small. Um, but I think it's always good to let me know because if you have something in mind, I don't know unless you tell me. Um, does anybody have any questions about the footprint? Um, we will be sharing vendor locations um, this week. So you're not, um, if you're like, I don't know where I'm at, um, that's coming out soon. So. I don't. Oh, no, no, no. We're starting on the square and the location that you're assigned will be your location um, through the remainder of the season, except for October 9th. Is that the other last question? Um, so I don't, we don't have daily vendors who are part of this call. This is all for full-time vendors, um, but daily vendors, their location does have the potential to change from week to week. 
because those are the vendors that we use as fill-ins for when full-time people are absent. So, awesome. All right, moving on. So we're gonna quickly go over the attendance policy. So this is something we went over in 2019. And then last year, it just didn't feel right to have an attendance policy during a pandemic. Um, so this year, I just wanted to give everybody a refresher on kind of what the expectations are. Um, so a no call, no show is when you don't show up to the market and you don't call me to tell me that you're not gonna be there. That's very, very, very bad. Um, I would like to know if you are, if you are not going to be here, um, if you know ahead of time. Um, so if you are, have a vacation planned or you're going to be at some other, um, festival or whatever, you need to email me that you are not going to be there. Um, don't tell me in person the, the week before at the market, cause that's in one ear and out the other. Um, uh, don't call me, uh, don't text. I want it in email because I want there to be written proof that you contacted me. Um, and that's for both of our sakes for organization. Um, also, if you can email me in a new email. So don't respond to some other long email chain that we've had. Just start a new email in the subject line, say, I'm not gonna be here May 10th and that's it. You don't even have to put anything in the body. You don't have to, in the body of the message. Um, so if you are going to be gone, um, I would like at least 48 hours notice so that I can get a daily vendor in there to fill your spot. Obviously, if there's an emergency situation, if you are on the way to the market, your car has broken down, like call 911, <laughs> like call your insurance and then call me. Um, I don't need to be the first call, but if you could please let me know, hey, I was on my way or we woke up this morning and all the kids are throwing up. Like, just let me know. Obviously I can't find a daily vendor to fill your spot, but at least I know that you're not no call, no showing. Um, so excused absences, those are anything that is outside of your control. If you get sick, if there is a family emergency, there's a natural disaster and a tree falls on your house and you can't come to the market, those are excused. I'm not holding you accountable for those things. Um, also, if you are a farmer who does not have produce um, until a certain date into the season, you're not racking up a bunch of absences because of that. Um, so basically once you start um, and then once your, your, your season's finished, those dates in between are the ones that I'm gonna be holding you accountable for. So once you say, hey, I'm out of produce for the season, then that's kind of the, you're not held accountable for any other absences that might come after that. Um, I am not a farmer, but I do understand that there are, it's somewhat seasonal and rotational. So if there's a week or two where you're, you know, your spring crops are going into your fall or whatever, and there's a week where you don't have produce to come to the market, uh, please let me know. But hopefully you all have planned schedules where you can still bring stuff to the market. Um, but yeah. Um, also, if you have a totally seasonal produce, um, again, like, like blueberries, you're only going to be here for six, four to six weeks. Um, just let me know what your target start date is. And then once you're gone, obviously that's the end of the, the session for you. Um, unexcused absences. Um, these are basically um, anything that is within your control. You're permitted three a market season. So family vacations, other shows, um, anything that is kind of planned and not outside of your control, um, that is an unexcused absence. Um, Pre-approved people are allowed to work your booth for you. So if you know you're going on vacation, you can totally have your cousin come work your booth if you trust them. Um, and you can just let me know, hey, I'm not, you don't even need to email me at that point, but you can let me know, hey, I'm personally not gonna be there, but such and such is gonna be running my booth. We do allow that as an option. Um, so I also, like the attendance policy, it was created, um, because 
we want we want vendors who are committed to their business and committed to the market. Um, but also it's a way to filter people who maybe need to be daily vendors first. Showing up for you know 30 weeks out of the year to sell, that's a really, really big commitment. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're finding vendors who are ready to make that commitment. Um, I don't want you guys to be scared of the attendance policy. I didn't create it so that I can, you know, be the, the attendance czar, you know, like I don't, I don't want to be like, oh, well, you had three unexcused absences. Um, so don't hear that. Um, obviously, if there's, if something comes up, like, you know, your best friend eloped and you're invited to come to the destination wedding, but you've already been gone three times, it's okay. Like, please go spend time with your friends and family. Um, I know that 99% of you want to be here. You want to be here selling. Um, there's just going to be a couple vendors who it's like, maybe they weren't quite ready for that 30 week commitment. Um, yeah, the, the point is, is that there needs to be a boundary somewhere. Y'all need to know what the expectations that we have of you guys. Um, but if, again, if there's, you have four or five unexcused absences, that doesn't mean that you're, you're getting booted out. Um, if you start abusing the attendance policy, it's gonna be obvious. Um, and at that point, we're gonna have a conversation where we just say like, hey, are you, are you really able to commit to this? Because especially this year, we've turned 50% of our applicants away. So if, if you are not ready or you're not able to continue on, we want to find somebody who can fill your spot. So moving on, um, the modified market. So if weather predictions are forecasting bad weather, then we will call a modified market. Basically, we will send out an email around 4 p.m if it looks like there's going to be high chances of rain um, or any bad inclement weather. Um, so I would suggest that you wait until the morning to make the call whether or not you're gonna show up to the farmer's market. So um, a modified market basically means that you get to choose to attend um, and it's not counted against you if you aren't there. You know, I understand that that some of you have products that really can't get wet. Um, and I don't want you guys to feel like you're on, you have to potentially sacrifice your entire inventory just to be there. Um, so the power is in your hands um, to choose whether or not to come to the market if we call a modified market. Um, but make that decision in the morning. The weather changes like nothing around here. At 4 p.m. on a Friday, it'll say 100% chance of rain. And then you wake up and it's sunny and they're wonderful market days. And you wanna be here for those. So please make sure that you're making that decision in the morning. Um, also, if you're planning on not coming, um, please let me know just for organizational standpoint. Um, it would be great to know that you're not no call, no showing, that you're like, hey, I'm gonna sit this one out. And that's totally fine. Um, Stephanie, let me interrupt for a moment. We have sure. a question in the chat. Um, if we are an every other week vendor, can we swap with the other week vendor in an emergency? Will it be the same vendor each week? Do we have every other week vendors? We have a couple. Okay. Um, that would probably be a one-off situation. Um, and um, I guess if that happens, um, I can talk to you. I don't know who said that, but I'll, I can talk to you offline about that. Um, it would just kind of depend on if the other vendor is available to do that. Um, I don't see a reason why it would be impossible. Um, but yeah, we can, we can kind of cross that bridge when we get there. Are there any other questions? Um, so last year we had two pop-up storms that decided to blow through the market. Um, so if a pop-up storm comes out of nowhere, I want you to know that you are allowed to pack up your things and you're allowed to leave. It's your call to make, but you cannot drive your car into the market footprint. And this is, 
this is one of those things where it's really tricky and there's really no way to have a black and white policy when it comes to this kind of stuff. You know, last year, it, it was literally out of nowhere. Just all of a sudden, it was super windy. I don't even know, I don't even think it rained. And if it did, it rained for maybe like 10 minutes and it was done. Um, but a lot of vendors packed up and left. But the problem was, is that cars were in the market footprint and there were still customers who were out shopping the market. So Rainbow Farm literally had their tent on a lamppost and they had a line of customers who still wanted flowers. So there were still plenty of people who were like, I don't care, you know, wind doesn't really affect customers, um, but it affects you guys. Um, so yes, they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was pretty impressive, you know, people really needed their flowers. Um, uh, but basically what I want to say is that if you're making the decision to leave, but your neighbor is making the decision to stay, please be respectful of that. You're allowed to pack up your tent, pack up your stuff. You're just going to have to load it out. Um, if, and, and we all have smartphones, we can all check the weather. Um, a lot of times like these things, it's just, it rains really heavy for maybe 10, 15 minutes. The storm blows out, everything's fine. Um, and then it ends up being a beautiful sunny day <laughs> directly after that. Um, but if a pop-up storm comes and it's obvious that we need to get out, uh, we will move those road closures. And at that point, customers probably won't be around the market just because it's, you know, bad, bad weather. Um, so again, I know these things are kind of tricky, but just think, you know, like if, if you're looking at the radar and you're like, it says I have 10 minutes before, you know, all heck is going to break loose. You can pack up your things and you can load out. Just don't bring your car into the market footprint. Unless if it's like totally terrible weather, those road closures probably aren't going to be there. <laughs> They're going to be, you know, up on top of the courthouse. And at that point, um, at, at that point, it will be a unanimous decision that the market is probably canceled at that point. We haven't, we haven't had that bad of inclement weather yet. Um, fingers crossed. Um, everybody say your prayers that it's allowed to rain on any day but Saturday. Um, also, this is, um, I don't know if this is in the uh, attendance policy, but it's a part of the guidelines. Um, you must be in your spot and ready to sell at 7.20 a.m. So we do not allow cars in the market footprint past 7.15. If you are running late, if your alarm didn't go off, it's okay. You can still participate in the market. You're just gonna have to load your stuff in. We can't have your car rolling in at 8.30 when there are people milling about. Um, so if it's past 7.15 a.m., and you do decide to drive your car into the market footprint, you will get written up. Um, this is something that I'm just a stickler about because it's public safety. Um, also because if customers are out walking around, they are not paying attention. <laughs> like, you know, we had a situation where um, it was like 8.30 and a vendor was trying to drive down Main Street and they had an old truck and a trailer and people were just not paying attention to the fact that this truck and trailer was trying to like back out of the market. Um, so it's just a dangerous situation that we want to avoid. So if you are late, um, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to participate. You just have to load your stuff into the market. Um, also, if you um, being late falls under our compliance. So if you are late to the market, it's just a warning. Um, but if you are habitually late, like every week you're rolling in at 7.30, um, then like that's just a, we just have a chat and be like, hey, what's going on? Um, and you are responsible for communicating um, all of the guidelines with your employees. And so you're accountable for your employees' actions as well. So if it's an employee of yours who keeps rolling in late, um, that is also on you, that's your responsibility. Um, so yeah, just make sure you show up on time. Um, do you have a question? You can show up really as early as you want. Um, DBI representatives show up around 530. 
and that's when we'll start doing road closures. There are a couple of you vendors um, who beat us there, and that's totally fine. Um, it actually, it, it always works out where there's the early crowd, there's the middle crowd, and then there's the late crowd. Um, and last year, we kind of got spoiled with the social distancing because uh, we weren't fighting other vendors to get into space. So that was kind of nice. So it shouldn't be too much of a problem this year. So yes, um, if you, hmm, um, I'm gonna see if I can go back to anything inside this, don't park here. <laughs> like don't park on this side of Second Street. Um, don't park on this side of Main Street. Um, those are places that are inside the market footprint. And even though we might not be activating, like we don't necessarily activate this part of Second Street, there might be occasions where we will, where someone will come in, like there was a couple years ago, it was some kids thing, but like Peppa the pig was gonna come to the farmer's market and we were gonna give them this part of Second Street to activate and it ended up raining, so it didn't happen. Um, so don't park your cars anywhere inside the market footprint. There are plenty of public parking spaces surrounding the square. Um, Andrew, if you want to write down who said that, um, I will send you a parking map that shows all the different spots. Um, you are technically allowed to park anywhere that is outside of the market footprint. Um, and I know that a lot of us tend to park really close because it's six in the morning and no one's there. Um, but if you could be mindful of the fact that, you know, your car is gonna be sitting there for eight hours versus a customer, they might wanna park there. Um, so we would prefer it if you wouldn't park directly next to the square, um, but use some of those public parking space, those public parking lots that are around downtown. Another comment question, did you say there will be vendors on both sides of Main Street this year? Um, she's asking for, yeah, yes, um, the press room part of Main Street, which is a no. No, the press room part of Second Street is a yes. But not Main Street. Press room. Going down Main oh, Street. yes. So there, um, yes. So this, this street isn't wide enough um, to have vendors on both sides because there's only um, th this sidewalk um, is privately owned by the the complex that press room and Walmart are in. Um, so we don't have access to set up vendors on this sidewalk. Awesome. Stephanie, uh -huh. I'm gonna assume the, uh, the garage over there, parking garage is safe? Yes, the parking garage is safe. Um, it's the second and the third level open right. up on the weekends. And you are more than welcome to park there. I think the lower level is for Walmart customers, um, but the second and third levels, those are open to the public. That's it. That's where we do. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. There and also the courthouse is going through a renovation right now, and that renovation should be done. Half of that renovation should be done close to the beginning of the market, and that'll be five parking spaces right, right behind the courthouse. Well, I mean, if I may make comments, I mean, I, I think we as vendors should be conscious of the fact that these parking spots on Second Street and that. Or whatever should be there for the customers. They're not there for us. Yeah. To make it convenient for us to we'll get to our gift because we don't want to walk about a hundred feet. I mean, there's customers because they can't find a close parking spot. Are going to go to the Exactly. And I mean, Grandville parks that car too, and they enforce it. They do. I mean, they go around and <laughs> make the customers move their vehicle that are parked right next to the square. So, I mean, you're only cutting your own throat if you decide you want to only walk 50 right. feet instead of 250 For those of you online, Roger was basically saying um, that those spaces that are close to the square, 
we really should be reserving those for customers. And I agree um, because if a customer can't find a place to park, more than likely they're going to skip out on the market all in, in general. Um, whereas you guys can fill some of the spaces that are just a little bit off the square. Um, the square is really walkable. Um, and like, I know because like, I work downtown um, and I want to park right next to my office door, but I park in public parking just because I know that there are boutiques and other businesses that need that quick accessible parking for their customers. Yep. That's actually like the biggest, the biggest feedback we get about our market is that, um, that people who are elderly, that they don't come to our market because parking is hard and because it's too busy. And so, yeah. I, I will say that there are five parking garages Being either built, currently, currently under construction or planned to open up within the next 18 months downtown, so. Yeah, I don't know if you're on um, speaker Andrew, but he was saying there's going to be five parking garages that are basically some are being built right now, but are scheduled to be being built. So hopefully that alleviates. So um, we are. Um, the question was, if we're going to have an hour set aside for um, elderly people to shop the market before. Um, this was one of those things that was kind of my decision. We really couldn't enforce that, you know, like if somebody who's, you know, 35, we're not going to stop them and say, hey, you can't shop now because it's elder hour or, or sorry, I'm, you know, that it, we're doing COVID safety. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I did say elder hour. Uh, we're going to cut that on video. Um, it just, it wasn't enforceable. And I think that the way that we're going to market it is that if you are in that category um, of trying to be more COVID safe, um, that we would recommend you come early um, just because there's not, we, we're not crazy busy at 7.30 in the morning anyway. Um, so I don't think we need to be setting aside a specific hour when really that hour is the, the people people who need to be showing up early to maintain COVID safety, that's the time that they should be showing up anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> awesome, so we'll, we will move on. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any more questions, keep putting them in the chat. Um, so, this is our um, supplemental um, currency programs. So the SNAP and EBT dollars, this is what they're going to look like this year. Um, the small um, tokens are food stamps. That's the EBT where customers will swipe their card at the DBI tent. And we will we'll give them however much money they swipe for in those tokens. But then we also get grant money from the Walton Family Foundation and the Jones Center. And they will double that customer's food stamps. So that's what those green cards are. Um, we also double um, senior farmers market nutritional program coupons. Um, and those come in a packet that's white. Um, and they're usually, it's just like a stapled packet um, with a cover on it. Um, but basically, if you are selling anything that's consumable, you can accept these green dollars and these green tokens and DBI will, will reimburse you. We are the middle person for those programs. Um, if somebody hands you a white coupon from the Senior Farmers Market Nutritional Program or WIC and you don't know what it is, um, don't accept it because you won't be reimbursed for it unless you've filled out an application with those agencies so for both of those, you would mail those coupons in and they would cut you a check. So if you are being handed a coupon that you don't know what it is, um, you guys are some of the, you're God's gift to this world. You're so generous and you don't wanna tell people, hey, I can't accept that money. 
and that's really sweet. You guys give away so much money or so much free produce. Um, and I'm not telling you you're not allowed to do that. But if someone does hand you one of those coupons, you're allowed to pin it on DBI and say, you might be able to say, hey, I'm not sure what that is, but the people in the black information tent, they should be able to help you. And then that way that puts it on us. So you don't have to feel like you're being the bad guy. You can just kind of say, oh, I don't, I don't really know what that is. I haven't seen that coupon before. Um, and then we'll be able to say, oh, this is a senior farmer's market coupon. You can spend that at these vendors, or this is a WIC coupon. You can spend it at this, these vendors. So always pin it on us if you are being handed something that you're not exactly sure what it is. Um, because I, I mean, I want you guys to be able to make money, um, but just accept the green coupons. Right. We double them. Yeah, I, I don't get, if somebody gives me a five dollar one, I don't get ten dollars worth of produce. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Dennis was saying that if someone shows up with um, a senior farmers market coupon that's slated for five dollars, you don't you're not the ones who are doubling that in product. We're the ones who are doubling that in the paper money. Um, also, so Rogers Farmers Market, Fayetteville Farmers Market, we all get a piece of this grant money um, and that doesn't transfer over to other markets. So basically if a, if a customer comes and they get double your dollars, they get those double dollars for the Bentonville market, they can only spend it at the Bentonville market. So there are times where they'll show up and they've had money that they've gotten doubled at Rogers or Fayetteville we can't reimburse that because we get slated a certain amount of money and that's over that amount. So again, pin it on us, say, hey, I don't really know what that coupon is. Why don't you go talk to that person? And then we'll tell them, hey, like this is the Bentonville Farmer's Market. We can't accept that. Um, are there any questions about that? Goodness gracious, it's almost. Um, so we have you don't. You don't. Um, uh, the question was, how do you make change for coupons? Um, you don't, um, you can, if someone's buying $3 worth of bell peppers and they're handing you a $5 coupon, you can make what their purchase is $5 worth. So you can throw in a few extra bell peppers and say, this covers the $5. Well, if it's a WIC coupon, we won't. Um, but you don't have to break change for those coupons. Um, but I would recommend trying to work with the customer and say, oh, you're spending $3 on this. My garlic is $2. Um, why don't you go ahead and buy that? Um, so yeah, you don't have to break or make change. All right. Are there any other questions? Sorry, I, I gotta keep trucking at 7.30. Okay, so our midweek market. Um, so DBI has attempted to host a Wednesday market for a few years now, and it's never really had a chance to take off and new markets are really hard to start in general. Um, it's just hard to get the word out about it, um, about it. Um, there's like, a, it's a catch 22 where customers want to show up if vendors are there, vendors want to be there if customers are there. And somehow most markets never quite get it right in that cycle. Um, and they peter out. Um, so rather than resurrecting the Wednesday market, we want to build on something that is already currently working. And what is working is our Thursday online market. So last year we kept the Thursday market open. Um, and that was, they ordered online through an app. Um, we did curbside pickup. And um, last year, let's see, I have it written down. Um, Last year, from May to October, the Thursday market brought in an extra $34,000 in sales. Um, right now, the app is bringing in, on average, $10,000 in sales a month. So we have a really, really good, solid customer base who already knows about the Thursday farmer's market, who's already using it. And what we want to do is just build on top of that. Question. Yes. Because if they're like, I'm doing strawberries, I like to say, 
Yes. Right. You can put, oh, um, I don't think you can do that. Dennis questions was, um, can I put in a minimum of what I have to sell in order to bring to the market? Um, no. So that's kind of where we have to figure out that balance. Um, cause if somebody orders only one pint of something, you're still on the hook for delivering that. Um, but you can go in and set, um, like maximums in the sense of like, if you only, if you know, you're only going to have this much of this product to sell, you can set a, a, um, a ceiling on it. So you won't sell above that, but there's not one for the, the opposite. Yeah, some vendors also will do, they'll, they'll block out dates mm -hmm. and try to compress their demand um, where they only have um, you know, two, two weeks out of the month. So I don't know if that would help. Yeah. But. Jamie was saying that some vendors will block out certain days in order to drive sales towards one day rather than splitting those sales across two weeks. Uh, and sometimes that works. Uh, we do have, again, a really solid customer base who orders every week. We have another solid customer base that orders every other week. Um, it kind of just depends on what their rotation is. Um, so basically what I'm picturing for the Thursday market is that we build on that. Um, produce items will still stay online and can be purchased through the app. If you have goods that you have to pick up, you have to touch, you have to smell, you have to feel. Um, we will still have, um, we'll, we're, we're gonna block off Main Street for people to still set up booths. So that way you, um, you still get your product in front of people. Um, and, but however, you're welcome to do both. So um, what I kind of see it as is that we would set up a rotation based on demand of vendors who are setting up. So maybe you're only on the hook for coming once a month or twice a month, but then your products can live on the app for the entirety of the market. So that way um, you still get to sell products, even if you're not physically set up at the market. Um, and what I think is super attractive about that is that produce vendors, then you know exactly how much you've sold the night before and you know exactly how much product to bring um, to the market. Um, and then what's attractive about that for kind of the goods and the crafters is again, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the opportunity to meet people, talk about your product, and you can kind of say, hey, I might not be here every week, but my products are for sale on the app. Um, and that way, if a customer buys something and they love it, then next week they can buy that product again, and it's not dependent on if you're set up. Um, so depending on how many people we have interested in this, um, we might have to limit the vendors who we can accommodate just because we only have 10 spaces on Main Street. And so I don't want the rotation to be like, you come in May and then you don't show up again. Um, so if all 60 of you are interested, then the rotation is going to be really, really slow. Um, this isn't starting until May. So Danya and I have some time to kind of figure out all the details, work out all the kinks. Um, and so more information will be coming about the Thursday market. Um, but I feel like this kind of solves the problems that most new markets have. Um, A, we already have that solid customer base who is ordering on the market. We have, um, and those people are, are like diehard market people. Like this is how they shop. This is how I met Danya is because she would order from the market every single week. Um, and I didn't get sick of her. She was awesome. Um, so I don't necessarily see this customer base just disappearing um, once the market starts because it's also a convenience factor. Um, and then by offering the flexibility of being online it takes off the pressure of having to commit to set up every week. Um, and then again, you can continue to sell your product even when you're not um, physically at the market because the more people we have talking about the app, the more traction the app is going to get and the more that's going to grow, which is going to lift everybody up who's on the app. Um, and so if you are a vendor who does sell seasonal produce, um, like, 
I really think that's a great opportunity for you to um, add in some extra income. Um, so I would really, really like it if you give it a try. I'm staring at Dennis, but I'm also staring at you other people who sell seasonal product. Um, so I think that it's at least worth it to try. Um, and then if um, you're also, you're not locked in. So if you're like, if, if after a couple weeks, you're like, you know, this actually isn't worth it then you can take your products off. So, um, does anybody have any questions? We're gonna be real quick. Great. So um, this is how I wanted to end our presentation, but then I was afraid I was gonna forget about it by moving to the other location or other presentation. Um, so after tonight, the action items that I need you guys to tell me, I need you to email me what your start date is. So I understand that if you are a produce vendor, you don't exactly know what date you're gonna be starting, but if you can give me a target, because I need to find daily vendors to fill your spot until you come to the market. Um, but um, opening day is April 10th. So if you are an April 10th person, just email me and say, I'm gonna be there opening day. Also, please let me know if you're interested in the Thursday market, um, online, physical location, both. Again, um, we're gonna be sending out more information, but I don't wanna be blasting everybody if not everybody's interested. Um, and then once I get this email from you, then I will respond with your market location. Um, so this is my tricky way of making sure that people are, have attended this meeting and are, if they didn't, that they're gonna watch the video. So send me an email letting me know what your target start date is. And if you're interested in the Thursday market and then we'll respond with your location. All right, so now I am going to go into um, this presentation. Let's see, wasn't there a way to make this full screen? Let's see. I haven't. Wow. Thanks. Um, so this is that presentation that I was kind of talking about um, when I went to Chicago, these people who worked um, with New York farmers markets, basically they tried to put together um, like a scientific study on how we can increase sales um, and customer satisfaction at farmers markets. So um, they basically said they think they have 400,000 people who walk through the Union Square market only in September, but only five to 10% are shopping. So this was for the Union Square farmers market. And they basically wanted to figure out how do we get more people to buy more at farmers markets? And what they did is that they took the science behind grocery stores and applied it to farm stands. So Walmart knows what they're doing. There's, there's tons of science that goes into visual marketing and how they lay out stores and how they display their produce. And so these people took those ideas and said, how can we apply that to farmer's markets? Um, this, is, I, this is like the nerdy stuff that I like, but they, I won't get too much into it, but this is how they set up the study is that they classified um, people in customers into like four different categories. Basically anybody walking by was a potential person that could be a customer. So they would track how many people literally walked by a specific farm stand. They would also track people who turned their head to look at the farm stand. And they said, these are the people who were impressed, they were making impressions on. There was a third category consideration, and those are the people who actually walked up to the farm stand, but they didn't purchase anything. And then finally, um, people who were actually buying from the market. And the way they set up their study is they um, were able to track conversion rates 
So basically, how did we convert people from exposure to impression or impression to consideration and consideration to, um, to people who actually bought something? And then we're able to compare that data after they um, worked with that farm stand to make some changes to their setup. So that's the nerdy stuff that I find really fascinating. Um, so this is what they found from that study. They were saying, how can we get customers to notice individual producers? So this is that impressions category. How do we get people to turn their head and actually look? Um, so what they found is that um, people are actually, their eyes are drawn to vertical strips. Um, let me see here. They have it written down for me in words that are a lot better than mine. Um, but a customer's eye is drawn to vertical strips of text when they're moving. This breaks up the natural tendency to scan horizontally. Um, so basically, you know, this is an aisle at some store and your eye is drawn to reading these vertical banners because it breaks up everything that's horizontal. So they're saying at farmers markets, there's a lot of missed opportunity for vertical signage. So their suggestions were clipping things to the poles of your tent, um, getting these A-frame or um, chalkboard signs um, and creating signage, anything that would break up the eye um, so it's not just this horizontal plane. Um, customers are drawn to layers and dimension. Um, most of the time your space, um, make the most of the space by using all three dimensions. You have height, width, and depth. The average customer will feel comfortable reaching up to two to three feet into a display without feeling awkward or inconvenienced. Um, they're saying use wooden boxes or bushel baskets to create depth or height. Um, let's see here. So they're basically saying this guy um, has like risers and he's putting his crates on risers. But what he's doing is he's tilting everything up and he's creating a sense of depth in his booth. Um, by tilting your display crates forward um, using wooden blocks, and that's just if you're, if you're, um, oh, if your crate is on the table, you can put something underneath of it to just tilt it up. Um, that by doing that, um, you're taking more advantage of the space that you have. Um, and that's just, you know, your eyes are gonna naturally see something that's tilted up rather than just sitting on the table. Um, the old saying, eye level is by level is simply not true. The sweet spot is between the waist and the shoulder. Um, the eye is attracted to color blocks. The human eye can see blocks of color from further away. Yellow is the color that can be seen from the furthest away. In general, put, bright, put the brightest product out in front and at the corners of your stand. You can create contrast. Um, light versus dark, rough versus smooth. Um, they're saying you can build the drama of the produce on your table. Um, also think about the color of your tent um, and potentially the color of your tablecloths and signs. I think the color of your tent is kind of the big one because if you're selling produce and you have a red tent, that's gonna create this red tint on everything that you're selling. Same with any sort of like goods or crafts the color of your tint is going to be reflecting onto your product. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, they said, create blocks of color with your products to make the stand more appealing. Yellow, again, is the color that the human eye can make out from the farthest. So put the bright squashes um, in the most visible corner. Um, they have like little success stories. For one participating vendor who wanted to move more potatoes, a few empty berry pints were placed under the side of his crate, effectively tilting the entire display forward. The producer saw an 11% increase in impressions as a result of the simple adjustment. Abundance. The old saying, pile it high and watch it fly. Um, that applies to farmer's markets. Um, small portions give the impression of the product being picked over. Um, so consolidate throughout the day. And they said, think that you have overflowing boxes, baskets, or crates. Um, customers hate buying the last of anything. It gives us the impression, it gives them the impression that's been picked over and rejected by those before them. Make sure your products are always consolidated and bountiful. Some products like ripe 
peaches or tomatoes don't do well when stacked in deep crates. So consider placing an insert in your crate in order to create, that's a, oh goodness. Consider placing an insert in your crate to create the effect of a mountain of peaches. So that's kind of what's pictured here is that they have an insert inside um, to create that bountiful overflowing nature. Um, so this is just an example that they had of, um, this was a vendor who had everything flat on their table. Um, and then by elevating it and creating that abundance factor, like they, obviously that looks better. Um, or it helps create more impressions. Um, let's see, I wanted to flip real quick to another page. Am I still screen sharing? Yeah. Um, so this is what I'm reading from. And if you're interested in this, I'll definitely send it out. Um, so this is non-COVID. This was, this was before COVID. This was 2019 when I went. Um, so the answer is probably yes. Um, this year, I mean, it's up to you guys, I guess. I mean, some people are going to do what they're most comfortable with. Uh, but again, you are in charge of your booth, so you can be in charge of packaging and handling. Um, oh, maybe I went too soon. Anyway, basically what I wanted to point out here um, is that they talk about having good signage. So I like this sign in this um, tomato picture because it, sh it shows what kind of tomato it is um, and what it goes with um kind of like some of the flavor profiles of it um so that is a way to elevate your signage by talking about your product signage can talk about your product without you having to talk about your product um i liked this one too um they said that you know like this picture of the garlic you can eat all of that and so by having a sign that's a conversation starter for people to oh i didn't know that you could use this part of garlic, how do you use it? And then you can get a conversation about the, your garlic that way. Um, so, so yes, within reason, obviously you can't extend like, I think it's in the guidelines how many feet you're allowed to extend past your tent. Um, I don't exactly know that number off the top of my head. Um, but while we're socially distanced, you have all three sides that you are allowed to utilize. Um, same with if you wanted to push your table back um, and have people kind of enter your tent, um, that's totally possible as well. What we don't want is we don't want you putting signs out that would block another tent. So just be mindful of that, um, that you are allowed to use some of the space in front of your tent, but it shouldn't be detracting um, or distracting for other vendors. Um, so how can a farmer get more people to slow down and consider making a purchase? This is, sorry, I did skip to that other one a little too soon, but signage, signage, signage. Good signage can act as a silent salesperson and will save valuable time. People don't like asking for prices. Um, make sure your signs are clear, neat, and informative, and always include your logo and brand if you can on any of your signage. Um, so what I like about this sign right here is that they're explaining what bok choy is, but this, the price isn't set in, stone, set in stone. They have it written in Sharpie, which I think is really important too, because um, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but a good sign is simple, readable, durable, and informative. Without clear pricing signs, sales drop because customers are embarrassed to ask for pricing information. Um, this was a success story. Participating, a participating producer had previously used index cards and a Sharpie for pricing signs. Staff created new laminated signs with the farm's logo, a product description, and clear pricing. Considerations increased by 17%. So if you want to develop signage, that's, you know, some of these small signs um, for whatever products that you have, we have a printer and we have a laminator. We might have to get to the point where we're charging a little bit just because if we're running out of printer ink or running out of lamination sheets. Um, but if you create the signs 
we can set up a date and you can come to the office and we will print them and laminate them for you. Um, I think that the signage piece is really important. Um, so just think about that. Um, he also says, tell, use signage to tell your farm's story, which I also think is a great idea. Um, your market stand is a direct reflection of your brand. Do the best to make sure it tells the story of your farm or of your business. Are you growing your grandmother's heirloom seeds? Are you a fourth generation farmer? Um, whatever your story is, make sure that it reflects in your branding and signage. Take advantage of every opportunity to include your logo on your product. Stickers and stamps are a great way to do this. So I know that all of you might not have a logo, but you have a company name and you can get stickers. And every time you bag up a quart of tomatoes, you can slap a sticker that says it came from this farm. And now every time that that customer is reaching on their counter for a tomato, they're making the connection. Oh, I bought that from this person. You know, so just these are ways to think about how you can keep connecting with your customers, um, even when they're not at the market. Um, so how do you get people to buy more products at the market? Um, this is kind of the upsell approach. So make a suggestion. Try placing potatoes next to garlic and include a recipe card for garlic mashed potatoes. Obviously, we don't want everybody doing garlic mashed potatoes at the farmer's market, um, but this is an example, a really good example that's gonna drive sales to your booth. Um, so think of recipes, think of ways that you can combine products um, in order to sell as a bundle. Um, also offering a multiple variety of one product to expand taste and purchase quantity for your clientele. So that's kind of depicted in um, these peppers. So if you are just selling sweet peppers, think about maybe planting a hot pepper or an extremely hot pepper. And then you can have signage that describes each different kind. Um, and then for me, if I was shopping with my husband, I would only want the sweet peppers, but he would want the spicy peppers. And maybe you have some sort of recipe for, you know, a hot pepper relish. And now you have people who are buying every single kind of pepper that you have rather than just one type. Um, I'm not going to repeat that. Um, Andrew made a bathroom joke. Um, so also there's the, 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 the idea of making striking deals with your customers. So shoppers are guided by shallow clues. This is cheaper than that. And latent emotions. This feels like a good deal rather than knowledge or deliberate thinking. So if you're selling a product and you say, hey, a quart of tomatoes is $6, or you could say two for $10, and then you're increasing that price point. Um, the discount game works for everybody because it gives customers that like dopamine hit um, and you get to maximize on profit. So um, try a two for one bundle, discounts for larger purchases um, or deals of the day. So if you have, um, a ton of tomatoes, you could have like a canning discount that you have assigned for like, hey, you're going to buy this many pounds of tomatoes, then it's this type of deal. Um, I like the deal of the day idea. If you have tons of one product, um, then you can make some sort of deal. Or if it's the, at the end of the market and you want to push some more, um, push more sales. That's why I think it's important that your signs, uh, maybe you're not locked into certain prices. Um, just so at the end of the day, you could say, actually, we're doing a special deal on these types of cucumbers or whatever it is. Um, okay, so active retailing. This is where, like, this is like the crux of it all. If you are actively engaging with your customers, um, they are going to want to come back to you over and over again. If you are slumped down, in a chair, texting on your phone, people probably aren't going to want to approach their booth. If you're not actively engaged in the market, why would, the, why would customers come up and start engaging with you? So just think about how your body language might be interpreted by customers. Um, I'm not saying that you're not allowed to sit or that you can't check your phone. Uh, we have a couple of vendors who use um, bar stools, which I think is incredible because you still get to sit down but your eye level with customers. So as they're walking by, you get to talk to them. Um, if you're slumped down in a chair, your eye level with your product. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, 
they said, um, as an active retailer, you should be engaging each customer that comes to your stand. Ask them, how are you? What are you planning on cooking tonight? How, um, I think that's a great question. Did you know that this is the last week for asparagus? So by talking to your customer, by engaging with them, um, you're gonna increase your sales. So he says, drop the cell phone and get out of your seat. Remember that people remember the way you make them feel, um, which I think is great. Um, so share your knowledge. You guys are the experts in your product. If you're excited about your product, then people are gonna be excited about it as well. Um, be confident, get to know the customer's name, let them get to know you. Um, the whole point of a farmer's market is for transparency with customers. So they get to meet the producers and makers of the product. Um, loyalty programs, this is another really great I idea. Um, a loyalty program will potentially increase the purchase quantity per customer. So if you have lettuce mix and it's an eight and 16 ounce bags, you can have your loyalty program be that higher price point bag. Um, so that way your dry, people will want to meet that threshold in order to get the reward, to, for, to get that loyalty. Um, as customers start engaging more with your brand um, and with your company, they're going to get to know you more and they might have suggestions. Um, not saying that every suggestion is worthwhile, um, but they shared a story, um, a dairy producer who was selling milk in a gallon and pint containers listened to a customer suggestion to develop a quart size. Sales increased by 15% for the course of the year. So if customers are actively engaging with your product, they're a part of a loyalty program, they're gonna feel like they, it's kind of like how you feel like with the, like with the sports team. Like when the hogs win, you say, we win, like we won the game. When they lose, it's like the hogs lost. We like to identify um, with what we're spending our time in. Um, so I think that's another great um, suggestion. Let's see here. Um, the other two things, sorry guys, I'm really rushing. I want you, we have, have two minutes. Um, so he was basically kind of saying like, you know, they did all this data collection with a team of people. Um, and you don't necessarily need a team of people to collect data um, at your booth. Um, you can be the, the person collecting data or you can ask a friend, hey, sit in with me. What are the observations that you are making? Um, knowing what direction that a majority of customers can are approaching your tent um, is really important. So when you set stuff up, approach your tent from both directions and see, oh, well, these bags are hanging here. Maybe I need to move those. Or this sign is blocking, you know, my best seller from this direction. So what are small adjustments that you can make um, for your booth so that as people are walking by, they want to engage with it? Um, he said, walk by your stand. Um, what catches your eye? Um, are they the products that sell the most? Um, if the answer is no, then feel free to rearrange. Um, let's see here. Also, is a particular product chronically undersold at the market? So at the end of the day, you're collecting all of, you know, of one product. Start thinking, why is that? Is it a product that people don't really understand? Do I need good signage in order to communicate what that is? Um, do you need to put certain products in the same space, um, you know, like if you are selling soap and then you have uh, like those crocheted things that go around it, but they're on two separate sides of the table, um, obviously those things belong together. Um, if you're a farmer, you know, why isn't eggplant selling? Maybe people don't know how to prepare it. Um, and so by just offering suggestions with signage or offering a recipe card, that can increase sales. Um, a participating producer, with delicious apple cider increased his sales by 8% by creating a grab and go size container. So that was just something he noticed, hey, I'm not selling any of my cider. And then he changed the quantity that he was selling it in. So these are some tips and some tricks. Obviously you're not required to do any of it. This is just information that I wanted to pass on to you guys. Um, 
you guys are phenomenal people. You work incredibly hard and it takes a lot of energy just to get to the market in general. And so I understand that, you know, maybe visual marketing isn't, you know, the first thing on your mind, but some of these suggestions are fairly simple and you're free to play around with it. Again, like I offered with the signage, you know, Donnie and I will work together and we will help you print and laminate things. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. So does anybody have any last questions? Don't forget to email me your start date. And um, if you're interested in the Thursday market. Stephanie, I will be here. I don't, I don't know how to email that well, so I'll just. Okay. All right, any last minute questions? Okay. Awesome. Well, Zoom people, thank you for joining us. People who are here, thank you for coming. Um, I truly think that our market is phenomenal. And, you know, people will, you know, to me, the way to build the market and to continue to create an excellent experience, it isn't to go out and try to find a new flashy vendor. It isn't to try to bring in some sponsor who's you know, going to invest crazy amounts of money. To me, it's investing in you guys and lifting up your businesses and giving you tools and um, trying to come alongside you um, because the more that you're invested in your business, you're gonna be invested in the market. So if there's anything that you ever need or have a question about, or if you really struggle with social media like or marketing, um, I want to hear those things because we might be able to come up with something that we can do social media classes or whatever. Um, so yeah, if there are things that the Bentonville market can help you out with um, and that makes sense for the entire collective of the market that other people would be able to benefit from, um, let us know. All right, I am hungry <laughs> and <laughs> out of breath. So thank you guys. I'm going to sign off on here um i don't know how to do that <laughs> andrew the meeting's over you can click it you pushed the red button andrew